Welcome to The Grizzly Beat, a podcast of Grizzly Times and Louisa Wilcox, where we interview scientific experts, managers, Native Americans, writers, and others to share their knowledge, perspectives, and experience. This comes at a time of enormous interest in the grizzly bear's future as the government proposes to remove federal protections, and citizens are asking important questions. We hope the information shared here will help listeners shape their own answers. This is Louise Wilcox, and you're listening to The Grizzly Beat. And we're here today with Bethany Cotton, who is the Wild Program Director for Wild Earth Guardians. Uh, and she lives in Missoula, Montana. And her focus is uh, protecting uh, wildlife in the American West. And maybe, Bethany, you can introduce yourself a bit by talking a little bit about your roots. Uh, Bethany, you, uh, you say that you grew up on a, a cabin that was part of your grandfather's horse-drawn logging operation in southern Oregon. What was it like to grow up in a, a resource extraction tradition, but then find yourself moving away from that? Hi, Louisa. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, my grandfather passed away when my dad was quite young, so I never met him, but the legacy was there in the land, um, in the 1,680 acres where I grew up, and old equipment and um, clear fact that the this was not virgin forest. This was a place that uh, had been used. Um, and so it's, I think it's quite common, actually, in my generation in the conservation movement to have one or two generations before us having worked directly in resource extraction and now many of us turning to resource conservation. Um, it's a lovely thing to have that be accepted and championed by my family. And uh, it's sort of ended with my dad working in the mills in Southern Oregon when he was uh, home from college in the summer. And he went on not to do anything like that once he had his degree. And, and then to have both me and my sister actually uh, work in active conservation roles. Um, I think it's a microcosmic example of a larger shift in our society, recognizing that resources aren't unlimited, that when we significantly impact our environment, that those consequences flow through the environment and impact all of us um, on our health and um, the functioning of the ecosystems on which we all depend. So. Um, I think it's a powerful story, and um, it's nice to see that legacy change as we move forward. Thank you. So, Bethany, you describe your first environmental act being uh, testifying at a hearing against a proposed gravel mine that was near where you lived, and you were 12 years old. Maybe you can share what that experience was like for you. Sure. Um, so I grew up outside, way up in the mountains outside of Ashland, Oregon, and um, it was this lovely winding drive um, to get up to the cabin. And at this big uh, hairpin turn, um, there was a proposal to turn that mountainside into a gravel pit mine. And uh, my dad told me about it, and, and I was appalled as a uh, precocious 12-year-old. And, and my dad said, do you want to go? testify, and we did. We went to court, and um, I have this vague memory of testifying before the court, and um, it was really interesting because the person who was proposing the mine had a granddaughter in my class, and so I think it really, who I later played volleyball with because it's a small town, um, but she, I think it hit him pretty hard, and he actually withdrew the proposal, um, and for me, it's this lovely memory whenever I go home, um, when I do that drive or pass that spot, that it's never been developed, um, and it's just this beautiful hillside, and um, in wet years, it's covered in purple vetch, and um, so it's, it's a special thing to have that memory, and I think it's always nice to have a, a win early in your career, as it were, uh, to hearken back to, um, because I... In my work, I often think about the Margaret Mead quote uh, that I never doubt that uh, a, a small, dedicated group of people can change the world. And what she had to say is, 
indeed it's the only thing that ever has. And it's certainly proven true. We don't win all the time, but uh, we can. It's a lovely story. So you describe Robert Kennedy as an early inspiration, leading you down the path to becoming an attorney. What did Robert Kennedy mean to you then, and uh, what does he mean to you today? Well, I, uh, I actually remember one of those grocery store free magazines, um, and it had an article about RFK Jr., and that he was an environmental attorney, and he is the founder of the Waterkeeper Alliance. And I just didn't know that was a thing. Um, I identified um, early as an environmentalist and um, wanted to work that way, and I was actually much more involved in theater at the time. And for me, the idea that I could be an environmental lawyer and sort of combine those public speaking um, skills or interests with advocacy was just clear that that was the right path. And so I'm one of these freakish people who figured that out quite early. And actually, we, my seventh grade teacher had us uh, write down goal statements, and she buried them, and we dug them up when we all graduated from high school. And mine actually says that I want to be an environmental lawyer. So um, I figured that out early. <laughs> wow. So you wove a lot of your work, a key part of the work that you do for Wild Earth Guardians, and you seem to have a special relationship with them. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, well, it's, as we mentioned, I grew up in Southern Oregon, and it wasn't until I was probably almost in my 30s that I understood that that is historic habitat for wolves, and it, it was it, until I visited Yellowstone uh, several years ago now, for the first time that I saw wolves in the wild, and it was just this realization for me that um, even this place that for me felt wild and natural growing up is broken. It's missing some of the key species, and um, the closest thing to a grizz in southern Oregon is my high school mascot, uh, but the bears aren't there, and the wolves um, are just recently are, and so for me it's this incredibly hopeful story that OR7 or Journey, the sort of famed wolf in Oregon who made his way to California looking for a lady, and he settled in the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest, which is quite close to where I grew up and where my grandfather had a cabin, and, uh, and I think his, their pack name is after the National Forest, but I think the, being the Rogue Pack is quite apt for he and his family, and um, I think for me, it's this incredible story of resilience that despite all the damage and everything that humans have done to target these species, uh, that if we leave them alone and we let them come home, that they will reestablish themselves and they will bring balance back to these damaged ecosystems. And uh, it helps me be hopeful about the future and about restoration and rewilding um, in the West and around the world. So speaking of the journey wolf and uh, some of these wolves dispersing again to Oregon, maybe you can talk a little more about your current work on dispersing wildlife, wolves, grizzly bears, lynx. Um, maybe you can talk about what your current work is about, why it's important, and perhaps a little bit about the implications of removing federal protections on grizzly bears and their possible ability to disperse. Sure. Well, I think that the, the key threat to that kind of rewilding and, and recovery for these species are, is us. It's humans with guns, mostly, sometimes with poison, um, sometimes with cars. Uh, but we've seen these stories of resilience like Journey and Echo, the Grand Canyon wolf who made it all the way down to the North Rim last year. Uh, we're familiar with some of the stories, but there are actually dozens more. Um, and unfortunately, most of them end in real tragedy, um, which is true of the Grand Canyon wolf. She was shot by a coyote hunter, even though she's 50 pounds heavier than the largest coyote anybody has ever seen and was wearing a bright orange radio collar. And she was shot anyway. And uh, the person who shot her is not going to be held accountable under what's called the 
McKittrick policy, which is a Department of Justice policy where um, the government doesn't prosecute folks who kill protected species um, unless they can prove that that person was trying to target that protected animal specifically. So it's sort of this get out of jail free card. If you say, oops, I thought I was shooting a different animal, um, then you are not held accountable. And uh, so it's a real problem. It's against basic tenets of North American hunting ethic is you're supposed to know what you're shooting at before you shoot. But the government's allowing these folks to get away with killing protected species. And it, it happens for grizzly bears. And if folks say, well, I thought it was a black bear, then they often get away with it. Or, uh, and so it's a really serious problem. Um, we have, uh, are challenging the McKittrick policy in court in the context of Mexican wolves because so many of the most critically imperiled gray wolf in the world have been killed uh, by folks who claimed mistake. And uh, so that's one area where we're working to try to ensure that these dispersing animals have protections and that those protections mean something on the ground um, and that they serve as a deterrent to carelessness at, at best and targeted uh, poaching at worst. Um, and we're trying also to remove other barriers to dispersing animals. So in Montana and Wyoming, we've challenged the state's failure to adequately regulate trapping of bobcats to protect imperiled lynx. And we reached a settlement in Montana um, that significantly increased restrictions on trapping in the parts of the state where lynx are present. Um, in Idaho, we just won that case um, and are working to there put in new restrictions to protect um, the snow cats. And uh, so we're always looking at ways to tr protect these dispersing animals. And in the context of grizzlies, uh, the proposed delisting removal of Endangered Species Act protections in Yellowstone um, is incredibly concerning uh, because while grizz are beginning to recover, and they're certainly in better shape than they were in the 70s when they were an original species on the endangered species list, um, they exist in islands. Um, and it's really like the concept of island biogeography. You have stronghold in Glacier National Park and stronghold in, in Yellowstone and Grand Teton. But if those populations don't interbreed, don't exchange genetic diversity, um, they will eventually um, have very serious problems, and you'll never see recovery in other areas like the Bitterroots and the Cabinet Yaks and the Sulkirks, um, which are all very important pieces of habitat, let alone historic range like Colorado or Oregon uh, or Northern California. So if we allow those protections to be removed and for the states of Idaho and Wyoming and Montana to open trophy hunting seasons as they are all chomping at the bit to do, um, we're going to see that the only place where bears are safe are, is literally within the bounds of the national parks and that the moment animals step out of the park, they will be at very serious risk of, of dying. And we just saw a prime example of that and it was just announced recently that last fall, Yellowstone's arguably most famous bear, um, Dub Scarface, was killed outside the park, even though he still has federal protection. So um, we're certainly opposing the delisting and doing work to protect the corridors, the habitat corridors between these populations and remove obstacles like domestic sheep grazing and uh, fences and roads that, that provide serious threats. Um, or pose serious threats to dispersing animals. Um, because if we can allow them that space and let them be, uh, there is the real possibility of natural recolonization. And humans don't have to be quite so involved. We don't have to uh, reintroduce animals places. We can just let them um, figure it out. And the thing that's so refreshing is they do. They find the best habitat. They're not going to settle in residential areas. They're going to find wild places that have good food sources and are secure. And uh, we're seeing that with bears, uh, but it would be incredibly premature to remove protections at this point. Mm -hmm. Agreed. 
So, Bethany, while you've worked in the American West and on conservation for many, many years, uh, not too long ago you moved to Missoula to uh, intensify your work here in the Northern Rockies. What were some of the big surprises that you found when you moved up here and intensified your work here? Oh, I think uh, I love that this is a place where people are used to living in, in what John Muir said, there's still teeth here, right? It's one of the only places in the world where you can go, and the species that were here 200 years ago are still here. Um, there are not nearly as many of them. We don't have the wolverines and the lynx and the grids and the wolves and the numbers that we historically did, but they're still on the ground. And I find it refreshing to run into folks who are excited when they see those animals and get a glimpse of them. And so spending time in the parks and spending time uh, watching them on a wild landscape is, uh, again, it's just reinvigorating for me. And, and the flip side of that is, um, of course, encounter uh, uninformed and dangerous anti-carnivore rhetoric and um, very heightened uh, statements that come out of very deep-seated fear-based myths, and it's clear there's an enormous amount of work to do to deconstruct that mythology and further educate people about the importance of these animals on the landscape and the things we can do to reduce conflict, um, and that it's time to put an end to trapping everywhere, um, that that practice is antiquated and cruel, and it's time for us to evolve beyond it and um, put an end to poisoning animals, especially indiscriminately, and to aerial gunning, um, that these are species that naturally regulate their populations if you leave them alone. But when you start to mess with it um, by killing them, you really upset the balance and you actually create way more problems than you solve. Um, arguably, you don't solve anything except for appeasing an uninformed minority interest. So um, it's really interesting. I. I, uh, I think that things are looking up, but there is still a lot of work to do. Um, and we look at examples like some of these ranches who are integrating all of the non-lethal management techniques and using dogs and range riders and flagery and uh, solar-powered electric fences and calving barns and real really putting into place these more modern technologies to live on this landscape in the company of bears and wolves and, and other uh, carnivores. And um, I think that is the way of the future, um, and we're just going to have to keep pushing it. Yeah. Well, touching in again a bit more on experiences with animals, you had an experience with a tiger. Uh, I did. In India, I think. <laughs> That seems to have been a turning point for you. Maybe you could talk a little more about that. Sure. I actually had this wonderful opportunity. I have a good friend who is um, from southern India. She's native Tamil, and um, she actually came and got her LLM, her master's in law, in the States. And um, she works in wildlife conservation as well. And she was getting married, and she invited um, some of her American and British friends to come to the wedding. And... I, um, it was just this incredible opportunity to get to go and um, culturally amazing and the food was amazing, of course, but I wasn't going to go to India without going to see elephants in the wild and that was my, uh, my real motivation was I really, I ha I've always felt this connection with elephants and they're such incredible, gentle, intelligent animals and I had never seen an elephant in the wild, so I went to... Um, I had planned to go to this place that's known for its elephant, and then my friend Shruti's family said, well, why don't you go to Bandipur, which is actually a tiger preserve in southern India, um, not looking for tigers, but because you, you have a really good likelihood of seeing elephants. And so I went up by myself. It's, it's a couple hours outside of Mysore um, in southern India in the Bangalore region, and uh, there very smart. They very much control access to the reserve. Um, so there are, there's a morning safari and there's an evening safari, and then the rest of the day the park is entirely closed to people. Um, so you sign up and 
I went out in the morning and had this amazing experience seeing elephants, and they were actually covered in flower blossoms. They were walking through these um, flowering bushes, and I'm not a big crier, but it definitely brought tears to my eyes to see this (laughs) mama elephant and her teenager and her babe um, covered in these flower petals. Um, So that was amazing, and I immediately signed up for the evening safari as well. Um, And we really didn't, or I'm I'm actually switching it. It was evening and then the next morning, and we went out and we really didn't see anything. We didn't see any elephants. Um, There was just not much of anything, and I had met this little girl. Um, Indian children are largely very precocious and curious, and she'd come right up to me and introduced herself and asked me where I was from, and she ended up in one of the other vehicles, and we crossed paths with them toward the end of the time period. It's very limited, uh, which is great from a conservation perspective. Not so great if you're desperate to see animals. Uh, And we crossed paths with her vehicle, and she said, Bethany, 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 we saw a tiger. And I said, yeah, right. I mean, I didn't say that to her, but in my mind I said, "Uh uh-huh, because it's just incredibly rare. There's only about 2,000 tigers left in India. They're almost all in the north. There's maybe 100 in southern India. So the likelihood of seeing one is just incredibly low. And But there was clearly some indication that maybe that was true because our driver took off kind of like a bat out of hell and then stopped a little bit, and we looked at the dirt, and there were tiger tracks in the dirt, and... We drove around, and I looked at my watch, and there were there were five minutes left in the safari. And I did this very woo-woo thing, which is not very like me, and closed my eyes and just talked to this tiger. And I just said, I would really love to meet you, and I hope you'll come say hello. <laughs> and we came around this corner, and this tiger was laying there um, 100 wow. yards away. And she was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. I mean, you see pictures of those animals, but in real life, and in the wild, they are incredibly beautiful animals. And she was facing us, and her tail was sort of wagging, and we just froze. Um, And all of us just sat there watching her, and the driver immediately turned off the engine. and, And then I could tell he was getting a little nervous because we were technically violating the time that we were supposed to be in the park. And so he turned on the engine after about 15 minutes, to go, and she immediately stood up and started walking toward us. And uh, so he turned it right back off again, and she just walked right toward us until she was about 25 feet away and then turned and walked into this bush and then turned around and sat down. So she was laying there with her head crowned in this flowering bush. Um, And I'll just never forget that picture in my mind. And it was a good lesson for me because my computer or my camera failed. So I don't actually have a photograph of it, which makes me sad, but it was a good reminder that sometimes when you've got your camera, you're too busy taking pictures to really experience uh, what's happening in front of you. And so I just experienced what was happening. And for me, it was a sign. I was doing climate advocacy work, um, and I just said, I think I need to go back to working directly on wildlife conservation, and I came home and applied for this job. And uh, this week, um, it will be my third anniversary um, working for Guardians. Um, oh, congratulations. Protecting carnivore species here in the States. Um, so I have an enormous amount of gratitude for that tiger. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, Bethany, as a woman who's been successful in conservation and conservation law and who's followed her dreams, what advice would you give to someone, maybe a young woman, who's just starting out? I just think it's so important to know that there are just no limits on your dreams. And if you're clear on what you want to do, you should go for it. And sometimes you have to put it out to the universe to understand how things go. I think in this economy and uh, that it's likely you'll have several jobs. Um, I'm eight years out of law school and in my fourth or fifth position in the conservation community, um, but it's, it's a supportive place, and I work with a lot of other powerful women. And um, it's, it's interesting. I was just talking to a 
young Native American man yesterday, and he said, I tell people, I don't care who you vote for, but especially if you are a woman or a person of color, you have an obligation to vote because so many people fought for your right to do so. And I think there is a piece of that that if I had lived 100 years ago, I wouldn't have the right to vote. I certainly wouldn't have had the right to go to law school. I certainly wouldn't have had the right to work in and do what I'm doing now. And um, so in some ways, it's, there's a lot of ease. I can do that. It's more than 50% of people going to law school are women now. And um, I'm going to go out and vote in the Montana primary in a couple days. And um, I think it's, it's important to speak your truth and to speak truth to power. Um, it's, it is the only way that things change. And, um, and so I do feel an obligation to help um, folks early in their career. And um, we just had our crop of summer interns start, and it's, it's always fun to have new folks who are in school and um, kind of starting out in the world. Um, and I, I think that that is part of our responsibility as good advocates is to work with the next generation uh, and have them feel empowered and supported and help them stay resilient because this work is, is hard. And um, we have victories and we also have losses and those losses are hard because it, it means animals are dying. Um, and it might mean something as extreme and serious as extinction. Um, so that's, that's heavy. Um, so it's important to figure out how to hold that weight um, and so the way I describe it is um, my motivation is love and outrage, um, love for these animals and these places and outrage at the way our species has treated and abused them um, and a responsibility to undo as much of that damage as I possibly can. That's really nicely put. Thank you, Bethany. Uh, you're listening to Bethany Cotton with Wild Earth Guardians, and this is the Grizzly Beat. Thank you very much. <laughs>